Hi and welcome back to the final part of the feature modeling lecture. After introducing feature models and showing how to translate them into different representations, we can now finally get to the real interesting stuff, uh, which is also my dissertation topic. So it's about analyzing feature models and finding interesting facts about feature models, the features, the dependencies, for example, to find bugs. And for finding bugs, we get into the first example of this uh, section, namely web configurators. In this example, it's a car configurator. And I'm not an expert on this, so I would like to hand over to Thomas, who somehow broke something in this configurator. Kind of. Do you care to explain what you did do and how did you do it? Thanks, uh, Elias, for introducing me. Um, so the idea is that over here we give you an example of a car configurator uh, which happened to be uh, Toyota in this case, but there are other car configurators out there which have similar situations. Uh, so configuring a car is uh, actually complicated. So why is it complicated? Uh, it's complicated whenever we do not want to have the default configuration. So many car configurators, many configurators out there are, uh, do have a default configuration that as a German person, uh, you cannot just buy the default configuration. You always have to tweak it, excuse me, and change it to your needs. So what are our needs? So uh, assume uh, for this car, I started the car configuration. And uh, obviously, the first thing that you choose are the wheels. So the wheels are the most important part of a car. And I wanted to have black cups. OK, that's logged in. Great. So but for these black caps, right? So these are these tiny pieces somewhere in the middle there. Um, uh, we also want to have a certain color for the wheels. Uh, so in this case, I'm interested in um, those white wheels over here. So we, we do have some white wheels. Uh, and I think this is this looks great together. Whoa, what happened now? Uh, something changed in my configuration. Uh, somehow the configurator automatically updated my configuration of the small center cup. So, and it updated it from black to red because for some reason uh, you cannot order this white uh, wheel together with a black cup in the middle. So maybe some designer said this is this doesn't look nice, right? So and you you really don't want to give this decision to customers. Uh, so I need to make another selection here. What is also interesting is that actually the selection, the automatic selection here, is not blue, right? So blue would have been the default selection here, but it's not the case. So Again, we want to go uh, to black wheels because this black cup is really important to me. So that's kind of uh, the most important part of the car for myself. So when we go and return to the black uh, wheels, uh, we again need to make our selection on the uh, caps again, uh, which then happens. OK. So let's confirm this dialog. Uh, we are done with the configuration. And we uh, go to the next step of the configuration. And the second important thing about configuring a car after the wheels is, of course, selecting the color for your car. And again, I don't want to take the default color because the default color, everyone will use it, right? So I really want to have a customized car. So we want to have a red car. Uh, so let's make the selection, and now we are happy, right? So now this is my car, but what's this? So this is a pop-up dialog that uh, popped up. Uh, and the reason is that my chosen color for the car is incompatible to the wheels that I've selected. And the engineer thought, instead of not showing the color of the car, uh, they will actually give me back to the decision of the wheels because the wheels are not that important as the color of a car. But not for me, right? So for me, 
imagine uh, or remember the most important part was the black cup in the middle. But what happens now is we don't have an automatic deselection over here. Uh, we even see that the wheels uh, over here in the diagram, in the preview, are actually other ones than those uh, listed over here. So they're not even included here. Uh, and I do have to make a selection. And if I would make the selection of the white wheels again, of course, then I would be going back to um, step three, because then it will again be incompatible to the black cap in the middle. So what the uh, what the dialog wants from us is making the selection uh, of this kind of wheel, and then we will also see that the image, the preview, is updated over here. I tricked the configurator, uh, and I tried to like uh, see how good is implemented, and I found out that I can cancel the dialog. So what happened then is. Uh, we were actually staying with these uh, default uh, wheels over here, uh, even though they are not available. So I simply canceled the dialog, I continued the configuration, and at some point in time, I derived at a certain price. And I will enlarge this a bit that you can read this. Um, so this figure basically shows us, OK, I do have a basic price. I do have my wheels, which cost 5,500 uh, pounds, and then I have an overall price. And for those of you that uh, have been in school and learned something about simple math, will recognize that this is actually not the sum of those parts. So uh, after continuing in this editor for a while, uh, uh, it turned out that there was actually a different price later on in the process. And the reason for that was that uh, the price was actually not only the base price plus one set of wheels, but there were actually two set of wheels. So there were four wheels in the color that I've chosen. So that was the color that I've chosen, the black wheels. And this was the default uh, wheels that we see in the diagram. OK, this explains the price in the other picture. But obviously, the question is, what happens with these eight wheels during production? Uh, will they actually be able to add all those uh, eight wheels together to the car? And I decided to not spend your tax money on this. I also decided to not pay my money on this. So actually, I do not know. But we are in contact with automotive companies with different automotive companies and some in some rare cases uh, it even happens that something like this is recognized during production and sometimes a human is actually checking these parts so canceling the dialogue in this example was not considered and led to an invalid state uh, there are frequent examples of the, such invalid states in uh, online configurators and um, in many processes, humans check these configurations. For instance, if you order uh, some uh, merchandising and there are different combinations of some logo and uh, some uh, background color or some color of the t-shirt, uh, then these are checked by humans typically and some uh, can be found automatically. But overall, we do have many constraints that appear arbitrary to us. Why, do, why, can, why am I not allowed to make certain uh, combinations here of those colors? They are not explained. And this is even independent of like invalid states. This is just the regular states, the valid combinations. It's hard to understand uh, why certain options are available and others are not. Thanks, Thomas, for this explanation. This You're is obviously welcome. a big problem with online configurators. However, it's not the only problem that you might have. For example, if you remember the introductory lecture, we had this uh, German car configuration. It was BMW, I think, where you uh, wanted to configure an enhanced Bluetooth telephone with USB and voice control. And it added some stuff. It also removed some stuff. It was not really transparent what was added and removed and was also really unclear why it was removed in the first place. For example, what does Bluetooth and USB and voice control have to do with Microsoft Office? I mean, 
you can ask whether Microsoft Office is needed anyway in a car, but there is no obvious uh, explanation for why there is a conflict. And uh, we can also look at entirely different examples. For, for example, here we have a notebook configurator where you can select uh, which kind of display you want and backlighting and all kinds of stuff. And uh, however, in this example, there was a mistake. Someone did a mistake while configuring this and uh, it just gave this little box that says invalid configuration exclamation mark and no ex uh, explanation of of what happened and uh, also no fix to correct this so you click on okay and probably <laughs> the configurator is still broken and you still don't know what to do so this is not really optimal another example might be this one where we can uh, Still, we are still configuring a notebook and trying to select Microsoft productivity software. Uh, for example, uh, by default, none is selected, but you can also select some of these Microsoft Office versions. It's also sometimes including Adobe Acrobat, sometimes not. And it's really opaque which feature combinations are actually, um, are actually allowed and also how the prices are calculated. This is, uh, if you rem remember the waffle example there, the prices were also kind of intransparent, but here it's much worse because why does this uh, uh, cost like double of this and it's not even clear which Microsoft Office version it is. So it's kind of opaque. And um, there are several ways of fixing this, but uh, one thing that might help if we want to address such issues is that we want to take our feature models, which we have specified, which we can uh, translate into formulas and analyze them automatically. And uh, by this, we can try to find out how such configurators work and how we maybe can build ourselves a configurator that also avoids inconsistencies like the one Thomas showed before. And also that provides explanations if there's an error or fixes if you want to uh, undo maybe a decision and make a better decision and so on. And also we still would like to know how to get at all valid configurations automatically if you remember this open question from the second part of the lecture. And to do this we leave the place of creating a feature model and also transforming feature models all over and now we go into analyzing feature models to improve our understanding of the model configurations. And here we equate products and valid configurations. And the basic idea where we start is we have to ask questions. We have to want to know things about feature models. For example, here I have a configuration. Is this actually a valid configuration or not? This already uh, did not work in the, uh, in the car configurator where we had eight wheels for double the price. Uh, it took a telephone call from uh, support um, from customer support to check this. So this was not automatic. But there are other questions. For example, we could ask, is there actually any product, any valid product? Maybe there is some kind of error in the feature model and we cannot select any product even. And if there is any product, maybe you are also interested in how many products are there? How much do we actually sell in variability? So it's pretty interesting from a marketing perspective. And of course, which products are those that we can configure. We can also ask more detailed questions about features. For example, here we have a feature. Is this feature actually selectable? Is it actually deselectable? So is there any configuration that includes this feature or not? Maybe there isn't, depending on how the constraints, how complex the constraints of the feature model are. And also we can talk about partial configurations. If you remember, a partial configuration is a configuration in which there are still open decisions. So some features are neither selected yet nor deselected. And you still have to decide whether you want to select or deselect them. And sometimes you may have a partial configuration which already contains a mistake. And if you already have a mistake, probably the configurator should tell you that you should go back and undo that mistake instead of you letting, uh, letting you configure all the remaining features and only then giving you an error. And also there may be interesting to find out how many of these partial configurations exist and which ones, are, uh, which ones are they. And there are also, these are the questions we are going to address now, but there are also other questions that you might address uh, 
and look up in the literature and there are many interesting feature model analyses for example whether there are some features which are basically one unit and are always occurring together or whether a constraint is redundant whether you can just leave it away and nothing changes or when you make a change or when you have one feature model and another feature model for example for a later version of some software product line how do they actually differ maybe uh, it uh, actually restricts the variability and you didn't know about that and all kinds of questions that are starting with why is this like this how can we fi fix that we're not going to look at these today to look into automated analyses we need another small recap from logics from theoretical computer science and we need new tools because um, this is a pretty hard problem to solve from the get-go Think of the Boolean satisfiability problem. It's a decision problem, so it has a yes-no answer. And it asks, is there any set, uh, assignment A that satisfies a given formula? So is there any satisfying assignment of a formula phi? We can also phrase this math mathematically. There is a satisfying assignment of phi if and only if an assignment A exists, which makes the formula true if it is evaluated for the formula. We know from theoretical computer science that this problem is NP-complete, so it can only be solved by non-deterministic uh, Turing machines in polynomial, polynomial time, probably at least if P is not NP. So in theory, you can take away from this that it's difficult to solve. In practice, whether a given formula is uh, solvable really depends on the domain in which you're working, and we will see how this uh, works for feature models. And if you want to find out whether a formula is satisfiable, you can use satisfiability solvers or set solvers. These are programs that are highly optimized tools. They are off the shelf, so you can just take them and drop them into your project and they can um, solve any formula you give them, at least theoretically. And they have been developed over the last uh, 20, 30, maybe even 40 decades. Um, in a very competitive way. So there are actually competitions between these sub solvers and they are trying to get much, much uh, better and faster every year. So we can just piggyback this success and take this for our feature model analyses. Such a satisfiability solver almost always takes a conjunctive normal form as an input. And you might now understand why we uh, why we had to learn about conjunctive normal form and uh, DIMEX format. So we can take this and put this into a set solver and get some kind of answer. As an example, um, for example, the formula X implies Y. It's satisfiable. You can think a second about what might be a satisfying assignment. So one satisfying assignment might be x is true and y is true. In fact, there's only one not satisfying assignment, namely x is true and y is false. But we are only asking whether there is at least one satisfy, uh, satisfying assignment. So that's all right. However, x or not x, uh, x or not x is of course also satisfiable because it is never not satisfied. This is a tautology, it's always true but x and not x is not satisfiable. Why? Because if you put this to true, this gets put to false and true and false is obviously false and the other way around it's the same. So this is a contradiction. And your feature model, even if you don't want to, might include such a contradiction. Now uh, we do a little bit faster um, some, some other recaps, um, or maybe this is not even a recap, uh, but something new. Instead of asking, is there any assignment that satisfies the formula, you can also ask a counting problem. How many assignments do, uh, does this given formula satisfy? And uh, this means you, you take all assignments which make this uh, formula true and count them. Take these kinds of uh, absolute value. And this problem is probably even harder. It's known to be sharp p-complete. This is pronounced as sharp and this problem is sharp set um, and uh, it is at least as hard as satisfiability solving in practice. However, there's also 
again, a class of programs which can answer these queries. So these are the sharp set solvers. And for smaller formulas, this actually works pretty well. And to make this more complete, we can put uh, another level to it and not ask after a yes or no, and also not ask for a count, but ask for enumeration. So which assignments does the given formula actually satisfy? So we are not interested in the count, but we are actually interested in the valid configurations themselves, leaving off this absolute value. And this problem, of course, is at least as hard as the sharp satisfiability problem. Probably it's even harder. It's also answered by, the, by its own class of solvers, uh, sometimes called all Z solvers. And we're going to look at every of these three solver classes and how they work on feature models, whether this is actually feasible. Now, this was a lot of background, a lot of recap. Uh, going back to the actual questions about the feature model, we can first try to choose the right solver for the question. So, for example, when we have a configuration, just want to find out if it's val valid, we can just put it into the formula. We can just evaluate it. We've seen this before in the second part of the lecture. But when we want to ask one of these questions, we need a kind of uh, automated solver. For example, when we want to know if there is any valid configuration at all, this sounds suspiciously like a satisfiability solver query because satisfiability solving answers a yes, no question. If we want to know how many valid configurations are there, this sounds like a counting problem. So we are probably best off by using a sharp set solver. Maybe we can also do it with a certifiability solver by uh, encoding the problem in the right way, but it's probably not going to be as efficient. And also, if you want to know all of the valid configurations, this is an enumeration problem. And in that case, we would ask an all that solver for this. So now we have chosen the right solver class and um, now we can try to formulate a query for this analysis on the solver. And the typical process for, for this uh, feature model analysis is always the same, so I'm sketching it here. We started with the feature model, we already learned how to get this into a logical formula, and also how to translate this into a conjunctive normal form in this Dimex format. And this is the basic input format for all of these solvers here. And then we have to formulate a query for the specific analysis. We are going to look into that in a moment, how this is done for these kinds of questions here. And then we have to use the right solver. So the SAT, sharp set or all set solver I already explained how to do this. And the solver gives us an answer. And most of the time, this is already the result. Sometimes we still have to interpret the result given to us by the solver. And then we have the final analysis result. And we just take this phi now as the uh, conjunctive normal form for a feature model. So let's get into it. First, we can start with consistency, cardinality, and enumeration for feature models. We just take the feature model formula and look what we can do with it in a solver. You just imagine you have a feature model formula and put it into a set solver, satisfiability solver, and it either says true or it says false. So the, the true is basically the thing, the virum shaped uh, T, and the uh, false is the, this one, the rotated one. And um, when we do this, it basically tells us whether there are any big modeling errors in our feature model. Yeah, or other uh, phrased differently, is there actually um, a possibility to configure any product at all? If the satisfiability solver says, yes, the formula is satisfiable, then we say the form feature model is consistent or configurable or whatever. Mostly we just say it's consistent. And if the satisfiability solver says, no, this is not a satisfiable formula, then it has to be, uh, there has to be some kind of contradiction in it, which does not allow us to uh, configure any product. So we call the feature model void, uh, or it's a different word for it's empty or inconsistent. A little less abstract would be the example below here. So um, we have the feature model with a root feature and an X and an Y, and they are in an alternative relationship. So either X has to be selected or Y. But we also have a cross tree constraint, constraint which says that it's not, it can, cannot be the case that X or Y is selected. And obviously this now contradicts the OR because the OR says that yes, 
uh, sure, one of them has to be selected, and the cross tree constraints uh, constraint rejects that. So this feature model does not represent any uh, configuration. On the other hand, if we take away this negation and just say x or y, the feature model becomes consistent because this uh, constraint does not um, contradict with the tree above. It does also not add anything, so we could just leave this away. So this was one possibility to check whether a feature model is consistent and can be configured at all. We can also ask another question, namely, how many products are there? So we've now probably established like, uh, like uh, this feature model is consistent, so it has at least one product. Now the question is these feature models over there, how many products do they have? And we just take another solver. We take our formula, put it into a Sharpset solver, uh, solver and it gives, gives us a number, the number of valid configurations. For example, for the void feature model, it's the same one as on the left side. The number is obviously zero because nothing can be configured. And for the consistent feature model, it's two. Which ones? We look at, at, we look at that in a second. Another question we might ask is the variability factor. So how is the share, the ratio of valid products compared to the products that are possible? So easy to calculate that. You just take the number of valid configurations divided by the number of possible configurations. And that is just two to the number of features involved. In this case, there are three features involved. So two, the, two to the three is eight, and there are two valid configurations. So the variability factor is two by eight. So 25%. 25% of all possible configurations are valid. This can be an interesting number to illustrate how restrictive your feature model is. So how many constraints are there in a semantic way and not just how long the list of constraints is. And for this, the variability factor is obviously zero because it's zero divided by eight. Now we've seen in theory how this works, how this works on a very, very small feature model with three features. And it's pretty uh, believable that this works with three features. However, we can ask the question whether this is actually easy or not easy. There's this uh, paper from 2009, which is a little bit provocatively named set-based analysis of feature models is easy. You can ask, okay, how much easy does that mean? Because the problem is still and be complete. You can still have a feature model which brings the satisfiability solver to its limits. However, in the context of this paper and in the context of feature model analysis, we usually say this is easy because it performs much better than expected. And uh, basically for all feature models out there, the satisfiability solver will give you a result and it will give you the result in below one second, usually much less than one second. And uh, if you just have one single thing you want to ask the set solver, usually one second is just about okay. However, not always does this mean that uh, this perceived easiness does not always mean that it's really fast. Uh, one thing is that you might have many queries for um, answering a bigger analysis. And if you have thousands of queries, which all take one second, it's maybe not so fast. And also you still have to formulate the actual query to your feature model. And you have to bring the feature model into a formula and into conjunctive normal form. And this whole process and the interpretation of the result may also take some time. So this is not taken into account in this claim. As for the sharp satisfiability solvers, so counting the number of valid products, we have a small example here to show you that that's a much more involved affair. So we had a, one of the top sharp solvers and tried to count the number of valid configurations of the Linux kernel. And we took the Linux kernel from several points in time. We extracted the feature model from 2003 uh, a bunch of version, versions from 2003, actually, and also a number of versions up until 2011. And the solvers which we have today can count the number of products from models in 2003 in about like between one second and 10 seconds on this logarithmic axis. However, 
already the feature models in 2005 and 6 give us problems. So we get a timeout. I think the timeout was set here to 30 minutes. So after half an hour, we still don't know the answer. And half an hour is a lot of time. And uh, also, if we take the later versions here, it's, uh, it's really basically impossible with current techniques to count the number of valid configurations. Uh, also, if you let it run for a month, it does not really help. And we can ask ourselves, maybe we can analyze the models from today in 20 years. That would be nice, certainly. However, probably we want to analyze the models of today, today and not in 20 years. So um, this is still a challenge, at least for a product line as large as Linux. Okay, um, we have now talked about um, decision problems, so satisfiability, also sharp satisfiability, so counting. Now we can also think about enumeration. We want all the products. We want to list all the products. Okay, we can do this with, this, uh, with an OSAT. So we take the formula, run the solver, and get the list of products. For the not uh, satisfiable example here, obviously this is an empty list, so empty set. And for the feature model with two products, we get the products. So the one product has root selected and X selected and the other one has root and Y selected. However, if you think about it, this is basically this missing arrow which we had in this uh, representations diagram, w uh, which showed us how to get from uh, CNF, so conjunctive normal form, to the configuration matrix. We've now taken this list of rules, which is a conjunctive normal form, and translated it into a basically an Excel sheet where each row is one valid configuration. And we learned about that, that that's exponential in size. So in other words, all that does not scale at all to realistic feature models. If you just think of a feature model with 50 features, which is not a lot, and uh, just imagine that each configuration is encoded with one byte, you already get one petabyte. Okay, one petabyte, you might say this is still savable, but a few weeks ago I tried to calculate the same thing for the Linux versions, which uh, I showed here, and uh, the number is so large, it's, it's basically not possible to, um, to compare it in any meaningful way. So I think the versions here had about 10 to the 900 number of valid configurations. And even if you, if you uh, burn all of these configurations onto a CD and, or DVD and you staple all of these DVDs on top of each other, it, it's not that you would just uh, have a tower up until the moon or up to the end of the universe, but to the end of 10 to the hundreds of universes. So it's, it's really, really impossible. So enumeration queries are, at least for larger feature models, not realistically solvable. Okay, we've talked now a lot about the feature model, but we can still consider individual features. And for example, we can try to find out whether a feature F can be selected or deselected at all. So for example, here in this, Example, we have root and x and y, and x is now forcibly deselected with this constraint. So x cannot be selected. It's dead. This is what we call a feature that cannot be selected. While root and y have to be selected. So if x is deselected and there is an alternative, y has to be selected. And we call features that have to be selected core. I've also read the term undead as an opposite to dead. And we can check this with the satisfiability solver really easy. We can just take the feature model formula and uh, assume further that the feature is selected. We can just uh, try to select it. And then the satisfiability solver says, yes, this works, so it's not dead. Or no, this doesn't work, so it cannot be selected, so it's dead. And also we can try to deselect it. And the sat solver can say, no, it cannot be deselected, so it's core. Or yes, it can be deselected, so it's not core. And you might guess this can also be done with the cardinality of features, which is which, with a sharp set solver. And for example, you could ask how many products 
does uh, do include a given feature. So um, you can try to find out whether the feature X is, uh, in how many features the feature X is included. We already know that it's zero. And uh, Y has the feature cardinality one. This means that Y is included in exactly one product. We already know the product, it's root and Y selected. And also similar to before, we can also have a kind of measurement how dead a feature is or how undead. It's called the commonality. And we can just take the feature cardinality and divide it by the number of total configurations. And in this case, obviously it's zero for X and one for Y. And um, the same can also be done for partial configurations, which is a, just a little bit more general. And this is really, really useful to build configurators, which we've seen in the examples before, these web configurators of cars and so on. So imagine that a user has some partial configuration. So the user has already selected some features and they have already select, uh, deselected some features. So they made some choices in their configurator, but most of the choices are still left open. They haven't decided yet whether they want a Bluetooth uh, controller. They haven't decided whether they want Microsoft Office and so on. And now we want to know, can they still further progress. So is there still a partial configuration which is consistent? Is this partial configuration still free of errors? So for that, we assume the feature modify and that every feature that is selected, uh, we assume those features. And we assume for each feature that is deselected that it's also in the formula deselected. And we put that into a satisfiability server. And if the satisfiability server that's says that that's okay, then the partial configuration is still consistent. So for this example, we might imagine that a user has already chosen that the root feature should be included and has already chosen that the X feature should be uh, excluded, should not be included. And this is a slightly different example from before. So there's no alternative anymore. And now the question is, can we still configure this? Is this already containing a mistake or not? So root is selected, X is deselected. And yes, of course, if X is deselected, we don't care about Y. So the left side here is forward. So Y can be anything. There are basically actually still two configurations left. And we can also find out this fact that there are two configurations left, of course, again, with a sharp set solver by taking the same formula as over here, putting it into a sharp set solver. And the solver will tell us the number of configurations selected prime, deselected prime, such that what we have already selected is included in this prime and what we've already deselected is included in D prime. So the extensions of the uh, formula of the configuration, which we've already done and count that. And in this case, it's basically root, no X, no Y and root, no X, no Y. Okay, this was a lot of theory, a lot of formulas, a lot of uh, mathematical stuff. How does this actually look in practice? Is there tool support for this? And yes, of course there is. So here we've shown uh, Feature ID, which is an open source uh, project for analyzing feature models and many other things, for example, implementation of product lines. But in this screenshot, we're concentrating on the feature model editing, and you already know the feature diagrams. We can just create such a feature diagram. But interestingly, this feature diagram is already automatically analyzed in the background. One example which we can see here is that sugar and topping have this exclamation mark, which means that uh, here that there are false optional features. And this is a, a new term which I've not explained before. Uh, it basically means that the feature is, um, is marked as optional but it is not optional. Why isn't, aren't these features optional? Because there's this sugar constraint here. I have to select sugar, although this notation suggests that it isn't. And this is something, a kind of inconsistency one might consider to change. And there's also lots of other things that Feature ID automatically analyzes. If you look into the semantical statistics, for example, here we see the feature model is valid. It's not void. That's what we've seen before. Um, and it also has some corded features. It's like a waffle, topping, sugar have to be selected always, accessories, customer, and plate. These are the core features. 
and there are no dead features. So at least we can select every feature somehow. And if you want to, you can also calculate the number of configurations, but because this is uh, kind of hard to calculate, you have to actually double click to do it. Because this problem is sharp set complete. And if you got the feature model, you can also open it into a configuration view and uh, have a kind of tree of choices. And some things are already checked for you because these are not deselectable. So for example, topping and sugar are not actually deselectable. This has been detected with a satisfiability solver and already selected for you. So you cannot make any mistakes. And now you might think about uh, checking any of these boxes. It also tells you that there's still 22 configurations left. So this is also a cardinality query, which we've seen before. And you might uh, think of, for example, you want to eat cherries. You check cherries and now it's checked. And all of this other stuff is now deselected. You can try to find out why. So these are the explanations which I mentioned before. And for example, this fork is now automatically deselected and it explains to us why namely because cherries was manually selected, but cherries implies that fork is also selected. So, uh, excuse me, it is selected, it's not deselected. And now we have to ch uh, choose which kind of, is it a plastic fork, is it a wooden fork, and so on. So, notably, this, um, this editor uh, does all kinds of things in the background. So after each decision, after each click in the editor, all features are selected that are now conditionally called, so that are in under these circumstances not deselectable anymore. And all features are deselected that are now conditionally dead. So these are the features that can no, no longer be selected. And this makes it really impossible to configure an invalid product. And if you do some configuration, uh, some step which you regret, which you think, okay, that this was maybe not the best part to take, you can undo it. You can also see why some things happen automatically. And this is something that's missing from, from some of the examples of the web configurators that we've shown before. Okay, let's recap. We've seen here now different examples how you can analyze feature models. We've seen quite a lot of stuff, but the basic idea was always that you took a feature model, translated it into a formula, which was translated into conjunctive normal form. And we had lots of queries that you can answer that are interesting for several different kinds of use cases, maybe for marketing, maybe for bug fixing, for testing, for implementation, for requirements engineering, for scoping, whatever. And we have seen some solver classes to answer these, these queries and that's the road so far. But you can also move on. And this is also a lot of open research uh, um, that is left to be done and that uh, can be interesting to, for example, extend our support or understanding of a large product line such as Linux. And um, you could, for example, consider ex uh, extensions to the feature model as done by UVL or other kinds of logics, other kinds of representations of formula, under uh, other kinds of queries to formulas and even other kinds of solvers and uh, could develop new analyses with these improve the efficiency of analyses that already exist if you think of counting products of Linux and of course investigate whether these are actually correct. So these are some open things we do in research. So summarizing the whole lecture, or at least this part of the lecture, if we want to build reliable configurators that don't do some things that we don't want to do, we basically need automated solvers or we have to reinvent solvers which is probably not that uh, such a great idea. So we could, for example, use satisfiability-based so solvers for detecting whether a feature model actually contains a big error or maybe smaller errors which make features dead, uh, unselectable. And we can also implement decision propagation. This is the algorithm I showed, which uh, enables you to build a configurator, basically. And we can also look into sharp satisfiability analyses, for example, calculating the share of valid configurations or the number of uh, the, the measure how dead a given feature really is or something like this. Because sometimes you have a feature that is uh, included in 0.001% of all conf configurations and you, so it's not that, but you might think about is this feature is real, if this feature is really needed. There's some further reading here. 
And as always, we have a small practice exercise and this one's pretty easy. Just have a look at this feature model and you should, your task is to think of one cross tree constraint. So a small formula, probably small formula, which we put below the model, which would make exactly one of these features dead. Not two, not none, but one feature dead. And you can of course check this uh, for its correctness by downloading feature ID and um, uh, editing this model and putting your constraint into the model and it will be shown whether that feature is dead. Okay, so thank you for listening. I'll see you for the next lecture.